They get in to the mosque, and so do I. No one else is inside except the other person helping him on his way, Muhammad Ali. So on the front row of the mosque was Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, Don King, and me. My name is Mark Saggers, and I have worked as a broadcaster for 40 odd years for various different platforms, starting off at the BBC Sport and Outside Broadcast in radio. I've worked for Sky Television as their senior sports news correspondent. Back to Five Live, presented uh, a lot of shows there, and to Talk Sport, where I now do all of the England football, all of the finals, all of the FA Cup, and much more besides. And as well as that, I'm also working with Amazon Prime as a reporter with their new 3D year deal with the Premier League. So two very quick ones for you. The first, Mike Tyson's release from prison in Indiana, penitentiary in Ohio. There for three days with Sky. Had to find something different. It was the first time we were going to do the live broadcast. But I needed more than that. So we went out there two days before. And I've always tried to see what's a backstory, what's different. And I had a relationship with Frank Warren and Don King. And Don King had always been going on about how Mike Tyson, when he'd been inside, was, had actually converted to, uh, a, as a Muslim. And uh, there was a North American uh, mosque down the road, and he used to go there even when he was locked away to um, follow his religion. So I went there the day before and said, is Mike Tyson coming here the minute he gets released at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning? And they said, you're the first person that's turned up here. Yes, he is. And as well as him, we're expecting somebody else who's uh, extraordinarily well known to be here and help him on his way. And I said, could I come in? And they said, you can come in, but your camera crew can't come in. I said, that's OK. So there we are now back at the penitentiary. And we're all on that driveway. And there are three, four hundred camera crews, reporters, most of them throughout the States, but the rest of us from around the world, all with step ladders, all getting up and doing their piece to cameras every hour on the hour at 20 past the hour for me. Me Next morning, out comes Sir Don King and Mike Tyson. Gets him into the car. He's wearing his cap at that stage as well. And everybody's expecting him to go right to the airport and then fly directly back to Ohio where he lives. They go left. We thought they were going to go left, so we'd already closed down and got on our way. Cut a long story short, they get in to the mosque, and so do I. No one else is inside except the other person helping him on his way, Muhammad Ali. So on the front row of the mosque was Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, Don King, and me. And they, they did their worshipping. We came outside afterwards. Off they went. And this was at a time where, just before Atlanta, when uh, Muhammad Ali came back again. He was always a superstar, but he wasn't quite. And he was just beginning to have problems with Parkinson's. They all went and left him. My job was done. I was just going to put together the package I'd got. And he and I spent an hour together. And that is something that only happened because I looked outside the box. And the other one is that Terry Venables gave me the exclusive story for when he uh, got sacked by England. I would, the first thing I would say is keep your mind open. Because until you really get ensconced with this, you don't know exactly what you want. You might think you know what you want, and you might want to be front of camera, in front of the microphone, but you might find that many further parts and assets in this fantastic industry not only suit you better, but suit your style a lot better and gives you much more of an op opportunity for a vocational career in broadcasting, not just the three or four years, um, the elements at which if you are a broadcaster, you can, of course, be uh, circumspect you could be a problem as far as you're concerned and the subjective nature of your bosses, that they'll move you on and other things. But I think go for it, enjoy it, don't be cynical, be a little sceptical, question things and read as much as you can and never, ever be late. Turn up early. You get lucky if you turn up early in our business. If you're late, people don't want to know you. I think what's really important with that is that uh, you, like we all do to start with, cram ourselves full of lots of knowledge and we think we know everything. And there are certain things that we do know, but what you have to develop as a broadcaster in particular, and even if you're going to be a producer, 
you have to develop a, a way of knowing your broadcasters and how you can write for them or, or how you can get the best out of them. But from the uh, front of camera, let's say, or in front of that microphone, one of the early things to do is to make sure that you look good and vocalise. And when I say look good, I just mean look smart. Look as if you mean you know what you're saying. Never guess and don't tell, which we all fall into the trap of, what you know. Don't be bursting in there to get it out of everything you know because people don't want to know that. What they want to know is what those within sport know. So learn to question properly and in a way that means that you can probably go back again to that same person. Read, get words the whole time. Reading is an extraordinarily good help for us. Breathing, take singing lessons, and just a free tip every now and again, and I have done it throughout the, my 40 years of broadcasting, is sometimes I think, am I not sharp enough or am I sharp enough about the way I question people? And when I know I'm not, I go back to the old Bailey and I sit down in the court, it's free to go, and I watch and listen to the barristers on the serious matters, on their lighter moments, how they deal intrinsically with getting information out of people. And that is available to everybody and something that I would thoroughly recommend. And the other thing that I would recommend as well, be yourself completely. There's no point in being anybody else. There's no point in mimicking anybody else. Be true to yourself. Understand what you're doing. Be full of integrity, full of knowledge, and you'll get on. It is quite extraordinary. When I first started in BBC Sport and Outside Broadcast, as it was, which was a unit at that stage that we looked after all of the sports, and we looked after all the ceremonials, though that would be royal weddings, funerals, festival of remembrance. And we basically, at that stage, had a teleprinter. And that was it. Nothing more than that, which was what, how they used to bring in through the press association any news. And that was that. So what you did was, you used to, we were working on an old typewriter, even for broadcasting, end of the day, interviews, file your piece, uh, even at that stage, a lot of the time down a phone. And that was it. And you were finished for the day. There was no 24-7. So that was the first big difference, 24-7 now. Moving into work when I did with Sky News right from the very beginning, we were taking on ITV, we were taking on the BBC. We were directly getting under their skin in a very different way. Uh, Sky News was Rupert Murdoch's conscience. He knew that news costs fortunes and he wasn't going to make any profit back, but he needed to get news into Parliament, into people who were people who could sort all sorts of things out in this country in particular. And uh, we went everywhere. We weren't rights holders in many places, but we absolutely went round the world with that. And uh, that again at that stage was not 24 seven as far as broadcasting. Twice every 24 hours for the space of five minutes, if we were outside this country, a satellite came over where I had to feed a three minute built package and a two minute live. And that was it. Now, of course, it's 24-7, social media, YouTube, Instagram, all sorts of other work. You can basically do everything. I think that's really helped in one way, and I think it's caused problems in the other, but very much what has become different is that we knew the sportsmen and women inside out. We were friends of theirs. We weren't giving things of uh, a private nature away. We were, we were trusted with what we did. And I find that something that we've lost along the way. I, I have my own Twitter feed, obviously. I've got not an enormous amount of followers, but over 100,000. And uh, follow a lot of other people who are uh, in the same business, obviously, as me, that I trust. Uh, newspapers, we all know, are dying in their old form. But obviously moving across, particularly with sport like The Athletic and others, to the medium that they work in so well. So I follow all of those those people. I still do use television 24-7, both with Sky News, the BBC and ITV when I need to, but I do it all now on the move. I do it all on my multi multimedia platforms, obviously my mobile phone and uh, also my computer. 
And uh, that's it, really. I mean, I'm, I'm on it, checking it all the time. It's, I'm a slave to it in some ways, which I don't like. I like to get away with it. But another thing with all of that as well is that the story now can be over before you've even started with it. And that is also another real problem for me. So suddenly you might be doing something else in a studio like you guys for a few hours or something like that. Then you come back out and the story that you thought had developed has actually already been ended for something else, but actually it hasn't. So the follow-ups are always very important for me and that's where I look outside. That's where the storytelling begins. Mm -hmm.